Hey, I'm Rob Berger. When I'm not rolling in the dough, that's right, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and holy cow, I just lived through these eight crazy nights with the candles and sweet wine and latkes or latkes or whatever, and some fairly ferocious chanting in some other language. I mean, it was fun. Don't get me wrong, but I am glad all that's behind us because that... What? Gotta hate it when you yell at me from the other room. Wait, we still got Kwanzaa and Christmas and Advent. Oh my God, we got Boxing Day and New Year's. Holy fuck! Are you kidding me? Oh my God, I'm never gonna make it. Well, if uh, your budget and liver is going to be as wrecked as mine is, swooping in to help us with at least one of those things, we welcome the author of Budgeting 101, CPA Michelle Kagan. Plus, how are people repaying their student loans? Sally May has a new study showing exactly where people are getting it right, and we'll talk to Rick Castellano from Sally May about where you might be able to improve. We'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Nick from Alaska, answer a letter from the mailbag, and still leave a little room for my quiet library-themed trivia segment. And now, two guys who you'll never see in a library, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G! That's very unfair. I love the library. I went to the library uh, the other day to vote. And you said, what are yeah, all it looks like a nice place. What are all these books doing here? Looks quite comfortable, actually. Looks like a big giant Panera, but without the food. <laughs> More libraries should have little pastry shops in them. And then I'd go. Like a Barnes & Noble. It'd be, Barnes & Noble, where all the books are free? How great would that be? Son. They kind of are. Let's like just sit there and thumb through them, as long as you're buying coffee. Uh, I'm really excited because mom's new basement in the Detroit area is right around the right around the block from the library. And I'm so excited to get reacquainted with the library here in Texarkana where nothing is all that far away. The library actually is four miles, but it's four miles in a direction. I never go for anything else. Arkansas. Uh, no, it's actually in Texas, but Hey everybody, welcome to the libraries for the win podcast. I'm Joe Saul. See hi, average Joe money on Twitter across the card table from me. This fine day is the man we just call the other guy or, OG. Thought it stood for original gangster. I think it stands for whatever you want it to stand for. You know, it dawned on me the other day that uh, we've been doing this show so long that there is a whole bunch of people that don't understand the other guy reference, like what that whole story morphs from. Or so the, someday we'll have to tell it. Or the bag over your head, all that stuff. Yeah. Yes. No, a fine story, but not for today. You know, it's a better story for today. We are rebooting our email list the stacker on january 1st and if you want to get in on all the goodness 52 weeks of financial lessons as uh long-time listeners of the show know you don't learn much listening to the stacky benjamin show you just have a good time but if you really want to dig in head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash stacker and sign up and you'll be ready to roll when the new year hits uh so excited to, to see how many people have joined us next year on the stacker by the way that's always free you can unsubscribe at any time but mom always puts hers on the fridge we got a great show today we're talking budgeting and you know what if there's ever a time, the time to do it i was just gonna say that if there's ever a time it's got to be now when the budget's just constantly being tested this is budget test time we've got that but first we got some great headlines so let's move hello darlings and now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. How would you like a spare $7.5 million, OG? Well, I mean, it's a pocket change to a guy like you, but, but you know, for the rest of us, it'd be all right. Yeah, it's a nice start. You can't live on it. Uh, we found this in Yahoo Entertainment. Actually, our producer, Richie, found this for us. Man finds $7.5 million in a storage unit, but that's not it. He bought the storage unit for 500 bucks from Storage War star Dan Dotson. So a dude, a dude who is supposedly a storage site pro uh, sells it for 500 bucks to another person and uh, surprise. Well, they do those auctions 
where you don't, you know, you get to like, all you see, either they open it up, you don't get to walk inside, you get to like look around. Yeah. But uh, it says, talk about a return on investment while attending a charity auction on November 1st. Dan Dotson, who operates his own auction house and frequently stars in Storage Wars on A&E, says he's approached by a woman who told him a family friend had recently purchased a storage unit he'd auctioned off and had quite the story to tell in the days that followed. Turns out the man, who is a friend of the woman's husband, found a mysterious safe in the storage shed that held a surprise of a lifetime. The first person they called to open the safe, I guess, couldn't or didn't, so they called a second person, Dotson recalls in a video posted to Facebook on November 5th. When that person opened it inside the safe, normally they're empty, but this time it wasn't empty. It had $7.5 million in cash inside. While it was a potentially life-changing discovery for the unit's buyer, it was also meant for someone out there who had just lost an enormous amount of money. But fortunately, this story has a happy ending for everyone involved. Dotson revealed that when the original owners of the unit found out that it had been sold with their cash still inside, they quickly contacted their attorney to negotiate a deal with the new owner. First, the original owners offered $600,000 to return the money, but then settled on a deal that saw the man return the money for a $1.2 million reward. While he didn't keep the full amount, the man still came out with $1,499,500 in profit on a measly $500 investment. Dotson and his wife, Laura, discussed what they would have done had they been the ones to come across that huge sum of cold cash. I don't feel I could be clean money, Laura said in the couple's Facebook video. Whether he'd take the $1.2 million reward, Dotson said he would, partly because he wouldn't want to find out how far the former owners would go to get their money back. I wouldn't ask a damn thing, he explained. $7.5 million is a lot of money, but that's a lot of running, too. Imagine if he'd kept the $7.5 million and uh, ended up having some people with baseball bats at his door the next day. Yeah, or worse. That's an interesting legal issue, though, right? Like, what implications are there from a legal standpoint? For something like that, you buy a house, you see these stories, you buy a house and you go in the basement and there's some long lost treasure of some kind, or I don't know who it really belongs to. You know what I mean? I but I'm they, glad they did the right thing and kind of the right thing. Apparently they had to settle on a, that's what I <laughs> so the right thing is to go, Hey dude, you found seven, I found seven and a half million dollars of your money. Would you like to swing by later this afternoon to pick it up? I got it in some duffel bags and have them go. Here's a stack of money. Thank you. Instead, they did the right thing by going, nah, I don't accept your settlement of 600000 The I right think, thing would be $1.2 million. <laughs> I think if you doubled that number. Yeah. The number I'm thinking of rhymes with schmillion. Well, and I think the issue here is what you're saying. It'd be fun if an attorney uh, listening would uh, weigh in on this. But I would think they'd have no legal repercussion, right? I mean, if the storage unit has been legally sold, and everything in it belongs to the new owner. Do you have any recourse on that money? I don't think you do. But I think the, I think the guy was right. That's, a, that's an awful lot of running for an awful lot of money. Let's try to turn this into some type of lesson here, OG. I think this is another reason why you don't keep lots of cash around the house. You tell, you know, you hear people that keep the joke about money in the mattress. But seriously, there's people that don't trust banks, don't trust anybody. So they keep the money in their house. And there's so many ways that ends badly. Yeah. And we're talking about a few dollars, you know, a couple of thousand bucks or something like that. And this guy had 7 million. Oh my goodness. That's how, how do you accumulate $7 million? I think, I think my friends at the uh, IRS might want to have a discussion about where that came from. A little, a little, make sure that that's been accurately reported. Let's just have a quick chat. Yeah. And in our second headline, the 2018 How America Pays for College Report by Sally May is out, detailing information about the various repayment methods for families and how everybody, of course, pays for college. And here joining us on my dad's shortwave from Sally May is Rick Castellano. Rick, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. Well, I'm so glad you are here. So let's talk about the study. What exactly did you guys look at and what did you find when it comes to people paying for college? Yeah, so this is actually the 11th annual report of How America Pays for College. So we conduct this report with uh, Ipsos, which is the third largest research firm in the country. We talked to about 1,800 parents and students who are currently enrolled in college. And it's interesting. We took a look at you know, really how they're paying, but also their attitudes about paying for college and how it really, um, how it really works for them. So and what we found, you know, when it comes to paying for college, 
you know, most families believe it's a shared responsibility. So parents, if you look at how they're actually paying, most dollars are coming from parents' savings and income, followed by, we are not, scholarships and grants, and then student loans. So, which is very interesting. I mean, we hear a lot in the media about you know, student loans being really the, the driver of how folks are paying for college. But what we've seen consistently, and more and more these days, are scholarships and grants are taking a, a more of a driving seat for families. And what's interesting, again, is that families are finding more cost-effective uh, ways to make college more affordable. Yeah, that is very good news. I wanted to ask just a clarifying question, too. When you say that parents and kids together are paying for college, has that skewed over the time that you've done this? Or are you seeing it being more of a shared responsibility than ever before? It's been pretty consistent. And it's interesting always that parents, uh, when it comes to paying for college, absolutely say, yes, we're in this with you. We're going to help you get to college. We're going to help you pay for it. Now, when it turns to paying back loans for college, that's where parents take a, more of a backseat and say the student is going to be more, more responsible. In fact, our report said about two-thirds of families say the student will be solely responsible for paying back student loans. Mm-hmm. And uh, some families say, and, and rightly so, wait until you're financially stable and help you along the way. But again, student loans for many families, it's, that, it's on the student to begin paying back And, you know, we're talking in November, this is when for many college graduates, that first student loan bill is due and that number and that bill hitting inboxes for students is somewhat of a wake up call. That's why families need to, you know, and students in particular need to enter this process very prepared and with eyes wide open and understanding their options. I was going to ask about uh, families being prepared when you say that so many people are turning to scholarships and grants. It seems like people are more prepared, but is that really what you found, that people are really prepared and know what they're getting into when it comes to the cost of college? You know, it's a great question. And I think when it comes to paying for college, the the stubborn statistic we find every year in how America pays for college is the amount of families who actually have a plan to pay for all four years of college. It's always hovered around 40%. I'd love for that number, I'm sure you would too, to be closer to 100% families are taking a step back and saying, you know, setting expectations early around paying for college or planning for college and then starting to develop that plan early. So many families have the talk, right? It's usually about other things besides financial planning or, or paying for college for that matter. But having that conversation early, families together having that conversation early, um, really helps set expectations. And what we found in our other study how America saves for college, which we do every other year, is that when students know that that money is set aside for them for college, they're more likely to attend college. Oh, So having that conversation early, setting expectations and developing a plan in a long run helps you be, of course, more prepared for that cost of college. When it comes to repaying the loan, one thing that we cover, Rick, that you've seen, I'm sure yourself with your job at Sally Mae, is people don't know all the different repayment options they have on their student loans. How do we get by that hurdle? Another great question. And I I think just taking a step back first, we always talk to students and families and say, first of all, know who you owe and how much you owe. So are your loans from the federal government or from a private bank? The vast majority of loans today are made by the federal government. We talk about that one, we hear it a lot, the $1.5 trillion in student loan debt out there. About 93% of that are loans made by the federal government. So most likely, you'll have a loan from the federal government and you'll have a servicer on your account. So understanding who that is and making sure that you're prepared to make those payments, critical. From a Sally Mae perspective, we're a private bank. We service our own loans so you'll know if you have a Sally Mae loan, you'll be paying Sally Mae directly. Um, so a little different there. But again, that just simple understanding of who, knowing who you owe and how much, of course, really goes a long way in making sure that you're, you're prepared to meet those payments. And when it comes to repayment plans, I don't want to speak for the department, but as you know, there's a number of different repayment plans available for the Department of Education. And being prepared and understanding all of those takes some time, but doing that, that legwork in advance will help you make an informed choice about which repayment plan is right for you. 
you know, when we go back to how America pays for college, we found about 60% of families say, you know, I'd rather make larger payments and pay off my loan sooner than stretch it out over a longer period of time. And we know that's sometimes easier said than done. But it's interesting to hear families, all things being equal, they'd rather go that route than spread out payments, which it ends up being, for many, a cash flow issue, right? Right. But if they have the ability to make larger payments or even make an additional payment, that goes a long way in reducing total costs. I like this idea of of being prepared, know who your servicer is first, and then look directly at them for what the different yep. options are. I want to talk about another thing in terms of getting prepared. You have in some of your material here, only 75% of families filed the FAFSA form, the free application for federal student aid. 75% sounds like a big number, Rick, but as you know, that means 25% of people out there are giving up a chance for possibly oh, some yeah. some money. This is my second stubborn statistic in how America pays for college. That number should always be 100%. Uh, and we've seen it fluctuate. It's been as high as 86%. Uh, some years, we're back down to 75% this year. But look, the FAFSA is the gateway to $150 billion in aid. We're talking about grants, scholarships, and federal student loans. Almost any family who completes the FAFSA will qualify for something. Just the simple act of doing it will open that door and open that gateway to aid. So yes, the form can be somewhat involved. Yes, they are looking to find ways to streamline it and make it easier for families. The Department of Education launched an app this year to help folks complete the FAFSA rather than filling it out online or um, through a paper application. So it's becoming a smoother process. I think we still have a little ways to go, but if there is one thing to take away from this conversation, if you're headed to college, or if you're going back to college, or even going to grad school, absolutely complete the FAFSA. Great advice. Where do people find the How America Pays for College uh, study? So if people want to dig in more, Rick. Yep. SallyMay.com slash How America Pays. We'll have our current research report, as well as our previous reports from years past. And if you're looking for information on completing the FAFSA, SallyMay.com slash FAFSA. And if you're looking for scholarships, we have a scholarship search tool, which is home to 5 million scholarships worth more than $24 billion. Holy cow. That's a free search tool. Um, you just fill out a profile and begin searching and it matches you with scholarships out there. And as you know, there's scholarships out there for just about anything. Being a left-hander, if you speak Klingon, <laughs> there's a scholarship for you, believe it or not. Uh, so that's um, at sallymay.com slash scholarship. I wonder if there's a scholarship for uh, basement-based podcasters. There probably is. You should, maybe you should start one. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, as if we don't have enough to do, Rick. But th- th- hey. There you r- go. Yeah. And you know what? If you're walking the dog or you're on your commute, we've got you covered. We'll have the link to Sally May, How America Pays on our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. Rick, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes to talk about How America Pays for College. I appreciate the time. Talk soon. When I heard that Rick from Sally May was booked on the show, I thought we were going to be talking about your overdue student loans, OG. I really did. My overdue student loans? Yeah. <laughs> they fought Rick from Sally May on the phone. I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him I'm uh, <laughs> out, out, out of the office for a little while. Big thanks to Rick for stopping by. And it's interesting to see how many people don't fill out the FAFSA. So important to fill out the FAFSA. I just uh, can't say it enough. I think that's lesson number one, fill out the FAFSA. Lesson number two is uh, find a safe with seven and a half million dollars in it. Yeah. Don't ne- tell anybody. Or negotiate. I mean, negotiate yeah. a settlement. <laughs> CPA Michelle Kagan upstairs talking to mom, OG. She's written books like Accounting 101, Stock Market 101, Investing 101, Everything Investing, Everything Accounting, Streetwise Business Plan, Streetwise Structure Your Business. She's uh, more than 20 years experience helping people manage their money. And today she's written Budgeting 101. So excited to talk about this, especially in December. Let's say hi to Michelle Kagan.
And walking down the stairs to the basement for a second appearance on the show, it's our friend Michelle Kagan. How are you? I'm good, Joe. How are you doing today? Well, I'm fantastic because we're talking about budgeting and every. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's funny, you know that half the people listening to this are saying, yeah. Yet I know you well enough to know that you see a budget more as freeing than confining, don't you? I think people have, and I blame accountants all over the world for this, that people have the exact wrong idea about budgeting. The exact wrong idea. It's the opposite of what everybody thinks it is. Well, let's talk about what it is then. What should a budget be? A budget should be the opposite of cutting costs. It should make it so that you never have to cut a cost you don't want to cut, so that you have enough money all the time and that you can build up a big pile of money so you can retire whenever you want. That I'm sure has a lot of people's interest right there because it obviously feels a lot different than what people expect. How do we set that up then? Let's just, obviously we're not going to go through all of budgeting 101 in the 15 minutes that we have you, but, but just starting with the basic groundwork, Michelle, where should we begin? The very first thing is, And, you know, people hate to hear this, but the truth is you shouldn't spend more money than you have. That's how people get into trouble. And most of that comes from ways they don't realize they're spending money. So when you're making a budget or a money plan or whatever you want to call it, that doesn't give you the heebie-jeebies, you can see where your money is actually going. And people are shocked when they realize what they are spending money on. When you use a credit card, Even then, at least you realize you're paying for something. But when you use an app or swipe your phone against something, you don't notice how much money you're spending. So it's a big eye-opening experience when people look at where their money's been going. Okay, so then step one then seems to me is you have to track your expenses. I'm hearing that loud and clear. Yeah, but you don't want to go crazy and and do everything. You want to get an app that does it for you. And you don't want to do it Every minute of every day, you just want to get a sense of where your money's going so you can make sure it's going where you want it to go and not somewhere you were like, oh, my God, I spent eight hundred dollars on turkey sandwiches. How did that happen? That's a big number. That sounds like a personal issue. Yeah, I just made it up. It's (laughs) it's not my number for turkey sandwiches. anyway. Turkey sandwiches right after Thanksgiving. Hmm. It's on the brain. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) So I'm guessing that's where a budget comes off the rails is we don't know how we spend money. But I'm assuming then that that's because a lot of the expenses that we have are expenses that are not don't repeat every month or every week like we think they all do. Well, and, and you know what? Those are also kind of bad ones, too, like the automatic, the set it and forget it expenses that you forget you have. And they can be for things you don't have anymore. Like, for example, I <laughs> I was working with a woman who forgot to turn off auto ship after her dog died. And people were just bringing boxes in the house for her. And she had like five cases of dog food because she forgot about auto ship. She ended up donating it. But. And that's a sad story, so I shouldn't use that one. But But, but, Yeah, but that's okay because, I mean, I've heard, and it's not quite as sad a story, but people forget that with Hulu, you know, that every month they have a Hulu subscription, they never watch Hulu, or they have Netflix and they never watch Netflix. Or Or they have both. Yes, yeah. Or A lot uh, of people have both and Amazon Prime and cable still. And you can't literally, even I can't watch that much TV in a day. All that comes from tracking expenses. But then as I'm as I'm setting up the nuts and bolts of my budget, am I then projecting ahead uh, how I'm going to spend money later? Tell me about how I do that. When you're talking about spending money, I don't feel like tracking money forward is a good thing to do because it's kind of like putting yourself on a strict diet and it's going to go off the rails. If you just give yourself like, I really don't want to spend more than $200 on going out this month. Instead of tracking every single time you go out, when you get to the end, you can set a little reminder in the app and it'll say to you, hey, you fit your $200 limit for this. Do you really want to keep going out this month? You know, as opposed to tracking every single expense. I think once you get rid of the stuff you didn't mean to spend money on, you're not going to have the kind of thing where you're forced to track expenses to come in under budget every month. I also found for almost everyone, it's a lot easier to increase your income than decrease your expenses. That's that's funny. I want to get into that in a second. Before we get there, I find this interesting because obviously some people listen to the show are hardcore budget nerds. 
are yelling at their <laughs> device like, I track every single penny. But what you're talking to is the 99.9% of everybody else that says, listen, there is a middle ground. You can do this without having to get deep in the weeds. I am a CPA and I can't stand tracking every single thing I do. I just, I can't do that. It drives me nuts. That surprises pretty much everybody I know. I'm sort of a big picture kind of person. And as long as I'm not spending more money than I have and I'm putting money into savings and I'm not running up my credit cards and I include that in spending more money than I have, I don't just mean cash in my wallet, things are good. And if I see that I'm going off the rails a little bit and I spent more money than I had coming in one month, I say, whoa, where did I do that? You talk about this a little bit in the book. It sounds like you like a kind of a modified, more flexible envelope system. Would that be true? Yeah. Although, again, even with the envelopes, I feel like you're kind of locked into categories and, and then people end up taking from one and leaving from another. And they still end up feeling like stressed out about which envelope that's coming from. <laughs> and and if that works for you, that's fine. For me, getting even that detailed, I feel like, all right, I have this pile of this much. This is my income after I put money in my retirement account and my regular emergency savings. This is how much money I have left. I know how much my mortgage and, you know, payments like, you know, I, I don't personally have a student loan payment, but student loan payments or car payments. The rest of your money, do what you want with it. It's your money. You should make you happy. And if you're going to if it's going to make you happy to track where that money's going, that's great. If it's going to stress you out to track where it's going, that's don't do that. Just don't spend more than there is. Yeah, I like a lot of what you say in the book is about also knowing where you're going is a big part of having an effective budget because then you're spending stuff that's important to that lifestyle. And also you write, don't buy into social pressures. I especially like this, Michelle. The social pressure to spend money can be overpowering. You see other people's Instagram lives or coworkers driving up in shiny new cars, and it's natural to want the same or better things. You face constant pressure to upgrade your phone and other tech, post vacation pictures that your friends, quote friends, will envy, and sign your kids up for every activity available. It's so hard to have an effective budget and to uh, watch everybody else live this perfection that nobody really, really is experiencing. (laughs) Well, yeah, because what you're seeing is people's outsides. You don't know what their budget looks like. They could be $200,000 in debt and freaking out every month and eating ramen. You see what they want you to see, but you don't know what's really going on. There are so many people who make $200,000 a year who are living paycheck to paycheck because they spend more than they have coming in. It can happen to anyone. It's not just people, you know, making minimum wage who have budget issues because actually they're usually a lot People who make less money are usually a lot better about not overspending, but you can't compare your insides to someone else's outsides. Great advice. How important is it, this old adage that people, you know, say over and over and over the whole idea of pay yourself first when it comes to budget 101? I think that is absolutely super important, paying yourself first. I think you shouldn't include savings as savings should be your first expense all the time. Retirement savings, especially if you're young, put any amount in there and you will be so happy you did a long time from now. And then you want to have basic saving. If if you're saving them for vacation, you want to put that first. If you're saving up for a car, you want to put that for your kid's college, whatever you're saving for, you want that to come before the things like, you know, having that extra glass of wine at dinner. Because if you want to achieve your financial goals. You can't do it if you don't prioritize them. You mentioned earlier making more money. When do you know that your budget problem is not about being frugal enough? It actually is an income problem, not a spending problem. There's sort of two answers to that. If you feel like you're being frugal enough, then you are. I mean, if you're not spending money on shoes and beer every night, then you're you're doing okay. If you're spending money on like basic needs, you can't cut expenses anymore. You just can't. You can't pay less rent because that's what your rent is. You can't stop eating food and not pay your electric bill. You can't cut those expenses. The flip side of that is if you want to be spending money on shoes and beer every night, then make enough money to support that. So it's sort of both sides of the same thing. 
you should earn as much money as you want to spend. And you say in the book that there's plenty of ways. You were surprised by how many ways there are to make extra money if you really want to. I actually was very surprised. I started doing some of them as I was looking into different ways to make money. I was like, wow, I can do that. Well, tell me so, what some of them are then. <laughs> well, some of them are crazy. Like I found this um, this app called Sweatcoin. And if you go for a walk outside with your phone, I mean, it's a privacy thing too because they GPS track you to make sure you're walking outside. You can earn money for walking, for taking walks outside every day. <laughs> That's it. Take money outside, get an Amazon gift card. Bam. I walk my dogs like four times a day. There you go. It's funny you say that because when you said that, I think about Google versus Bing. I don't really care about my search engine as long as it gets me where I need to go. And Bing, I signed up with them. A friend told me a couple of years ago and I signed up there. And once I got used to hitting Bing instead of Google, they pay me to search. Like I get, I don't know, I get a couple of holiday gifts this time of year with Bing points versus uh, having to buy them. So funny stuff. Yeah, like little things like that, they really add up. And there's uh, so many like grocery shopping and shopping apps like Swagbucks and stuff for gives you like points back for things that you're buying anyway. Not that you should buy extra to get the points. That doesn't save you money. But on stuff that you're getting anyway, you might as well get points. There's things like if you are at work during the day and your car's not in your driveway, you can rent your driveway to somebody else for four hours a day. I mean, things like that are just simple little things that, and if, you know, for example, I live near a college, the kids are always trying to park. My neighborhood has things where you can't park on the street. If you don't have a sticker, they go crazy trying to find places to park. I can rent my driveway for like 40 bucks a day. A bunch of money. Yeah. Yeah. How great is that? If I could do that in Texarkana, that would be fantastic. Yeah. The uh, I couldn't rent it for forty bucks uh, a decade, but that's a whole. But I got to find another way. There's plenty. There's plenty of other ways. When people have to have to cut, you said having a good budget is not about cutting. But let's say this become evident that you definitely have to cut. Have you found that there's some areas that are easier to cut when you're budgeting than others? Yeah, I found that after you've cut whatever you can realistically, without sitting in the dark, eating soup out of a can, it's easier to cut big expenses than little expenses. Because when you're cutting little expenses, you have to make a ton of cuts. If you cut a big expense, one cut, you're done. So things you can do are downsize where you live. If you live in a three-bedroom apartment, you can get a two-bedroom apartment and it might suck for a little while, but then you won't be stressed out about money eating soup out of a can. Or you can get a, you know, downsize your car. If you have an SUV, you could get a smaller car. Not only will the car cost less, it'll use less gas. The parts are cheaper. So it, your insurance will be cheaper. It'll save you money way, you know, like have a ripple effect down the line. Another way, if you're really, really struggling to make ends meet, one thing you can do is change your withholding. And that will put extra cash in hand right now. You may end up owing at the end of the tax year. But if you if you need extra cash right this minute, you can lower your withholding and have more cash in your paycheck right away. That's your own money. You don't owe it to anybody else. Do you have one budgeting app you like better? You've mentioned using budgeting apps to help you track money. You have one you like better than others? I don't know. They're honestly all pretty much the same. Yeah. I mean, most of the people use Mint because it connects up to everything else really easily. YNAB, you need a budget. Yes. A lot of people use that and really like it. it. I mean, it sort of just depends on which one clicks with you. There's a new one that just started called Well Wallet that actually sort of tells you how your money is helping the world or hurting the world, which oh. is kind of interesting for people who, who like stuff like that. But they all do mainly the same purpose. They just sort of have different styles. So your style will help you figure out which app will work the best for you. I find most people start with Mint and then move on from there if, yeah. if they find it doesn't match them. That's what I did. I moved from Mint to Clarity Money, which I liked because it was cleaner, to Tiller, which gave me the ability to do whatever the hell I wanted. I could, you know, because it's more spreadsheet based, but way more similar than different. The book is called Budgeting 101, 
it's not only packed full of goodness, including, by the way, when you talked about knowing yourself, you've got a whole different uh, budgeting personality section in this book where people can go through and find out what their budgeting personality is. It's funny how different OG and I are when it comes to our budgeting personality and <laughs> busting budget myths, uh, which I like right at the beginning and about how to break out of the paycheck to paycheck cycle. Uh, where do people get the book, Budgeting 101? Well, they can get it on my website, singlemomcpa.com, or you can get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, in the actual bookstores. My mom sent me a picture just so I would know. Isn't that always great? <laughs> yeah, mom. That's still going to be and great. Can I just say one more thing about something that's really important? Yes, please do. A lot of people hate to look at their finances because they judge themselves, they're mean to themselves, they're ashamed of where they are. And here's what I tell them. You are where you are. You need to know what that is. It's just the situation. That's all it is. And what matters isn't how you ended up there. That's where you are. What matters is what you do next. So look at where you are. Don't be mean to yourself and just figure out your next move without judgment. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to my incredible trivia segment. Michelle Kagan was spot on with all the budgeting stuff, wasn't she? It's too late for my wallet after these past eight crazy nights, but I'll, uh, what? Oh, my God, no way. The Golden Globe nominations are out already? How am I not going to rent all the Golden Globe-nominated flicks? I know, rent from the library, but here's a question. Where do you even find finance books at the library? Here's... Today's question, though, what is the name of the organizational system used to categorize and find books inside of libraries? I'll be back with your answer right after this. The following is an actor, not a real person. We tried to find an actual Stacking Benjamins podcast listener, but we're not sure any exist. Yesterday, I turned on one of those other podcasts. Ugh, more money talk? The topic was something called long-term care, and they couldn't even make me care for the short term. That podcast made me feel like just another number. Hi, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, the huge star of the award-winning Stacking Benjamin Show. Are you tired of podcasts that blabber on about money? Are you confused about all this IRA, SEPP, 72T, and fiduciary talk? At Stacking Benjamins, you're not just another number to us. Heck, if you actually listen, you're the only number. That's why we barely ever talk about money. Better yet, we treat you like family. We'll invite you on down to Joe's mom's basement, serve you some pie and maybe even a little lemonade, and best yet, when you leave, we'll complain about you behind your back. Because that's what real family moments are all about. I'm never going back to that old podcast. Stacking Benjamins is a way for me to avoid numbers and feel that warm, fuzzy feeling I get every time I scream at my sister on the phone. Stacking Benjamins, where you're not a number. Your family. Welcome back, trivia fans. I have good news and bad news. The bad news? Yeah, I think it's going to need a band aid and definitely some back teen, but let's not dwell on that. Instead, Let's focus on the good news. Before the break, I asked you this question. What is the name of the organizational system used to categorize and find books inside of libraries? Your answer? Well, during this amazing holiday season when your budget's crunched, one holiday recognized around the world today celebrates the Dewey Decimal System. First created by Melville Dewey in 1876, of course, that was his first name. The Dewey Decimal System is a proprietary library classification system which started as a small pamphlet and now covers four huge volumes of classifications. We'll classify this trivia question as completed. How about that? See ya! Big thanks to Michelle Kagan for stopping by. I love how Michelle makes sure, OG, that good is not the enemy of perfect or perfect. Isn't the enemy of good. Like when you go to budget, don't try to do every single little thing. Mm -hmm. I love her. 80%. Yeah. I love her focus on that's annoying. Just track what you spend. 
and set some numbers. And I love how loose she is about it. Cause when you hear people talk about budgeting, it's all about, no, 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 it's that 63 cents goes in line E16 on my Excel spreadsheet. Sounds like Len Penzo. Uh, who is Len Penzo? <laughs> it does sound like Len, doesn't it? It's so great. But budgeting, especially this time of year, get, getting your budget in order today so that you're already roaring at the start of the year. Uh, nice time to focus on this stuff. If you if you can swing it, it's it's tough. You're juggling a lot right now. But if you can juggle budgeting too, that would be fantastic. Hey, OG, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and we'll tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. 1.2 million bounties on storage units. I guess I've got my new investment idea. <laughs> Just buying up storage units? At $500 a throw. I mean, well, yeah, what could eventually. Go, what could go wrong? You'll hit it sooner or later. Yeah. It's like the one-armed bandit up at uh, Windstar. And then you'd have more time for your loved ones and your time, which is what would. Haven Life says. It's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. And just as an aside, I was explaining to my son, Nick, the other day, a little bit about how cool Haven Life is. And I told him, I said, they've simplified the process. And he said, well, what was bad about the process? And that's when I realized so many people have no idea how onerous the life insurance process is the traditional way. If you've never been through it, like my son hasn't, you have no idea, OG, just how long it can take. Instead, their application is simple and online. You get an instant coverage decision. Those don't normally happen. Their prices are affordable. Policies issued by parent company Mass Mutual, who's more than 160 years old. So you know you got that in your corner. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. That's stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. How nice would it be for your loved ones if underneath the Christmas tree was a brand new life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. It's a gift that keeps on giving on you. <laughs> you might not feel, you might not feel uh, secure when you sit down for your holiday meal for a Christmas dinner. No, really eat more of the cranberry sauce. Have some more coleslaw, please. Today's call comes to us from, it looks like this says Nick from Alaska. Say hi, Nick. Oh, hello, Joe and OG. This is Santa uh, Nick calling from the North Pole, uh, Alaska. Oh, I have to say, I travel around the world once a year and love catching up on the show. It's a jolly good time, even though I don't learn a thing. Oh, here's my question. I've got terrible budget problems. Several years ago, I told the missus that I'd give presents to a bunch of kids I don't know. <laughs> Pay it forward, she said. You'll become a legend. That sort of thing. Well, I have to say it's gotten out of hand. <laughs> Every stinking year, I load up my sleigh, I mean, uh, my uh, pickup, with all of these toys. It used to be trucks, trains, and Barbies. But now they want iPads, Xboxes, and thousand-dollar phones. I mean, I give these ankle biters everything they ask for, and they always just come back asking for more. <laughs> I know what you're going to say, OG, and before you say it, I've already tried to cut my costs. We had the great idea of stuffing things in socks to limit the amounts. But before you know it, that just became an add-on. And now these rascals all expect a sock full of junk and their silly presents. Oh, greedy little. And all for what? All I get in return is a few Christmas cookies. And now they're all gluten-free. Where's the fun in that? Between us. I've even gone so far as to hire a bunch of undocumented workers. They're out in my workshop behind the house, making knockoff purses and jewelry as we speak. I wouldn't be surprised if the feds knock on my door tomorrow and shut us down. And uh, if that weren't a big enough problem, we use deer in our uh, delivery system. And the animal rights people are breathing down my neck. I really, truly don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> so here's what I need to know. How do I cut when there's nothing left to trim? What would you do if you were me? Thanks, guys. <laughs> Sounds like a big problem that uh, Nick 
is having a lot of different irons in the fire. Hard to uh, concentrate on one specific thing. You know, you've got logistics issues, manufacturing issues, obviously banking issues and savings and that sort of thing. I think the key here might be price point. I mean, sometimes talking to Michelle earlier, sometimes it's an expense problem, but other times the real key is you got to go out and make some cash. I mean, if he's giving away all this stuff to all these people, it might be an income problem. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like you can only control two things. You know, you can control what's going out and what's coming in. And if you've done everything you can to cut what's going out, the next thing is you got to start figuring out ways to make more money. As an entrepreneur, the great news is there's all sorts of different things that you could do to ratchet up a few dollars. I mean, it sounds like he only works one day a year. Maybe he could start working a little bit sooner rather than just around the holiday time. Maybe he could work in like November and uh, there's probably like public appearance things that he could do to make some money. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, you pictures, gotta... you know, autographs. I mean, it sounds like he's a pretty popular guy. So a lot of different things probably to raise some cash, some side hustle stuff. Thanks for the question, Nick. Uh, we also get letters down here in the basement. Uh, this letter comes to us from Adam. Hello, Joe and OG. I'm 25. I've been working full time for just over two years, earning about $53,000 a year. I'm about 20000 in debt, including auto loan, college loans, credit card debt. I put 6% of my salary into a Roth 401k and recently opened a Roth IRA and trying to max out as best as possible. My biggest question is how should I be allocating my money in my IRA? Should I actively speculate on the market or more? Yes. <laughs> or more so set it and forget it. Also, do you have any other general recommendations regarding my financial situation? Thanks for nothing. You guys, thanks for nothing. I had to double take here. Thanks for nothing. You guys suck. Never learn anything. Where's my free shirt? Well, first of all, Adam, you don't get a shirt because you wrote in. You didn't Nick call does. it. Nick did. Nick's getting a free shirt. But uh, no, no, no shirt there. And uh, thanks, Adam. You suck, too. Let's tackle this. So set it and forget it. No, actively speculate. That's a way better strategy. Ponies. Nobody ever loses any money. Yep. Yep. I remember this myself. And I was just thinking when he said I'm 25 and I'm making 50 grand a year and I'm working for two years, I was thinking like, gosh, I wish I was 25 with $20,000 in debt, like two years into my career, making 50 grand, like starting over. <laughs> Those were the days. No, not a care in the world. It's like that, I don't know, it was a Buffalo Wild Wings commercial or something where the dude's in the fantasy league and, and it cuts to him and he's like, no job, no family, just walk away from it all. That's that's my number one fantasy. <laughs> and they're like, Bob, it's your number one fantasy pick. Number one fantasy pick. Oh, and he's like, oh, oh. Um, uh, Deshaun Watson. <laughs> you know, <or> whatever. <laughs> but he's totally like zoned out like, yeah, that's my number one fantasy. Just walk away. And I remember being this is where I was going with all this, I guess, is we get excited about steps 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 in the process and don't want to do steps one, two, and three. But, but the important things are to set the great foundation. It's a stupid analogy and I hate it, but you got to think of it this way. It's like if you're building your house and you go, I'm not going to pour a foundation. That's pretty boring. Nobody's going to see that. I'm going to spend all my money on really cool siding and windows. Well, if you don't have a good foundation, you know, obviously the house collapses. So the same thing is true with your money. So you've got to spend the next couple of years getting the good foundation down. And that is making sure that you've got a really healthy, gigantically large fat cash reserve, 10, 15 grand. You've got to get all of your consumer debt paid off. There's no sense in having student loans and cars and stuff like that. Cause if you don't tackle it now, you'll be 30 and this stuff will still be there. Yeah. You know, and you'll go, well, I just got rid of that car payment, but now I'm going to have another car payment. And oh, by the way, my student loans are set on 25 year paybacks, you know, and you're paying a hundred bucks a month and it's not moving at all. And, and I can tell you on the other side of 30, you're not going to want to be dealing with your 23 year old problems anymore, financial problems. You're going to have 30 year old problems. They're different and bigger and more annoying. And you still don't want to have the 23 year old problems hanging around also. So take the next couple of years of it's fine to do the 401k. It's fine to put money in the Roth. That's cool too. But, uh, but get the cash reserve built, p get the debt paid off. You know, you're only talking about paying off 10 grand a year for the next couple of years and it's done. Save 
five or seventy five hundred bucks a year for the next couple of years to build your cash reserve up. And then you can start doing some of this other cool, fun stuff like max not your 401k and and uh, it's difficult buying Bitcoin and stuff like that. And it's you know, we don't want to be flippant about it. It is difficult to pay off ten thousand dollars of debt when you make fifty thousand. But um, well, yeah. So if it takes, you know, if it takes three years instead of two, yeah. so be it. Yeah. But don't let it take seven. Yeah. You know, just get it done with. Yeah, I like that. You know, and I also like getting back to your asset allocation question. I definitely would set it and forget it if he didn't get that we were kidding there. But here's the thing that I would do at at 23 years old. I still think as long as you know what a bumpy ride it's going to be. I think at 23 years old, if you're using something like a betterment or an asset allocation strategy, one of these robo ideas that aren't 100 percent equity, I think you're messing up unless you're somebody that just can't take the ups and downs. But if you're set on a long term trajectory and your brain's in the right spot, I personally, I think in this and this might sound crazy, I would put it all in small cap value. I put my Roth 401k in small cap value and, uh, and I would ride that thing. That is where I would go. If I were 23 today and I can't get that money till 60, let's put it in the spot that historically has always been the number one place over those, those time frames. And sure. Is it going to bump? Absolutely. Is it, it's going to, it's going to bump a lot. It's going to be a bumpy, bumpy ride, but man, I think at that, at that age, and especially Listen, if you just started your 401k a few years ago and you have maybe a couple thousand dollars in it, let's say, if you've got a couple thousand dollars and it goes down 10%, you've lost 200 bucks. And I don't like losing 200 bucks, but certainly a $200 downturn, while at the same time you're continuing to stuff probably more than $200 in there right now, you're buying a lot low while you're losing very little while it's small. I don't know. What do you think about that? Too dangerous? I just look at it from the behavioral side of that. And, and I think the problem is, is then you got to, you have to pick a time to diversify it later. So early on, you know, what's wrong with, certainly I'm all equities here as well, but what's wrong with saying, you know, I'm going to have 60% of my money in the U S and 40% of my money internationally, you know, I'm just buying two funds or 70, 30 or whatever allocation you feel like picking. If you want three funds, you could do, Big U.S., small U.S., international. You but know. where for a if you do that for older investors, I would scale back the small cap in in the U.S. The small company stocks. I would scale back the emerging markets exposure. But if you're 23 and you can't get at it until you're 60, till you're 59 and a half, I'm going to crank up my emerging markets. I'm going to crank up my small cap. I'm going to keep the pedal. Yeah. Down. No, Even I know you're looking at it from a old man's perspective looking back, but, um, us young fellas, you don't have that perspective of time, I guess. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's nice. I'm, I'm sitting right here, by the way. I love how you look right at the microphone when you say that. That's good. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Adam. If you've got a question for the show, Adam wants free t-shirt. He's, he ain't getting one. Uh, but Nick's going to get one because he called the Haven Lifeline. Uh, StackyBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail for the Haven Lifeline. Or if you'd like to write us a letter like Adam did, StackyBenjamins.com. And uh, we're running maybe a couple months behind on letters. We're going to have a letters episode coming up on Wednesday uh, so that we get caught up. Love doing those. Uh, but Haven Lifeline, we always, you're always uh, just a couple weeks away on, on that. That's going to do it for today. Thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this show. Uh, this one is going on Mom's Fridge. This uh, is on Stitcher. Somebody left this review. Jess, 1903, five stars, says, entertaining and educational. Despite what Joe and OG say, I do learn from them, especially from OG's answers to mailbag questions and his critique of news events. Love the humor on the show, too. Thanks for a great show. Thanks, Jess, for that. And Mom is uh, bragging about Jess's review all day long today when the Bridge Club comes over. Uh, lastly, if you'd like to be on OG's waiting list to talk to him in 2019, him and his team about better financial planning in your corner, uh, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash letter O, letter G, stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG. All right. We'll see everybody back here Wednesday with a letters episode. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? 
first, take some advice from Rick Castellano from Sally Mae and fill out the FAFSA form if you're attending a higher learning institution. Maybe some of that debt you're about to get into could be avoided. Second, I'm loving the advice we hope you learned from Michelle Kagan. Don't worry about tracking every single dollar. Just build yourself some constraints so you know where your money is going. Roughly. Track every penny if you want, but a budget doesn't have to be painful work. But the big lesson? Don't hand Joe's mom tinsel and lights and ornaments and a hot toddy at the same time. That woman's her very own neighborhood Christmas parade, and I don't mean that in a good way. Trust me. Special thanks to Michelle Kagan. You can find more from Michelle at her site, michellekagancpa.com, and her book, Budgeting 101, wherever books are sold, or at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Powell's. Thanks also to Rick Castellano from Sally Mae for coming down to the basement to talk about how America's paying for college. You can find more at sallymay.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at @sbenjaminscast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Normally, we don't talk about money anymore during this part of the show. But uh, OG sent me this awesome piece, which is hilarious. <laughs> I don't have my iPad when I do the Money in the Morning show and we just do headlines. I have this little thing that I press that's dumbest headline of the week. And this <clears throat> would be the dumbest headline of the year. This is from Bloomberg. And it's written by Frederick Balfour, where to invest a million dollars right now. And as you said, when you sent this to me, you said, this reads like satire, but they're being completely serious. Ah, uh, yes. Six experts. Revealed, you know, if you've got a million dollars laying around. Yeah. Let's say. Which that, also is a funny headline. But. Let, let's say you found seven and a half million in a storage locker mm -hmm. and you negotiate okay. your way up to 1.2. What do you do with the 1.2? Uh, Got it. Finder's fee. So you Google it. You go, I have a million dollars. What should I do? You get a trusted news source like Bloomberg and six experts to give you some recommendations. Six. Let's hear them. They reveal promising investment options for substantial sums. If you've just made a nice windfall selling your property, came into fat inheritance, or just happened to have a large nest egg sitting around, here's some ideas from our inaugural survey of experts on where to park a million dollars. <laughs> I'm not going to read the next sentence because we're going to get there. Darren Wu, who's director of the Wuhan Phi Group. Because of my family background, my grandfather founded Li Chong Gold Dealers in Hong Kong in 1950. I believe in the physicality of gold. And it's so funny. I started reading just that. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? We're going to open this a million dollars. I put it in gold. Gold. <laughs> and, just, and sure I believe, enough. But he believes in it, Joe. Yes. I would buy a million dollars worth of bullion bars and stuff them under my mattress. By the way, Wuhan Phi Group, of course, I believe, sells gold. 
Well, interestingly enough, also he failed to mention that his grandfather that started the company probably did not get rich by holding gold. He got rich by buying and selling gold, trading it. Okay. Yes. Uh, I buy a million dollars worth of bullion bars and stuff them under my mattress because, as we said earlier, stuffing. I, I put it nothing in st- goes wrong there. I put it in storage locker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They never find it. Breaking Bad style. Gold has underperformed the S and P five hundred index for the past five years. Yes. Yes, and will also underperform for the next five hundred, just like it has the last hundred. But carry on. SPX with S P five hundred has delivered forty six percent in that time, and gold has lost one percent. In, in the next, but he believes in it, Joe. Oh no, no, no! You you got to think about this. Listen to the next sentence. In the next ten years, gold is one of the best contrarian plays. I say buy when no one else does. Okay. Even right. better yet, you want to double down on this? He Love says, it. I also like the idea of digital tokens backed by physical gold. We actually talked to somebody who's in that type of digital technology, but once again, you're getting into you're getting into Cyber currencies, I believe you should stick your million dollars in cyber currencies backed by gold. Duh. All right, what's the next one? Oh, oh, Maybe I don't like that option. They give everybody another way to play, each one of these experts, the other way to play. I'm also a classic car collector. Uh-huh. For the past several years, nearly everything's appreciated, but don't be fooled by rising tide lifting all boats like stocks. Blue chips will fare best in a downturn. That means focusing on investment-grade cars that are rare, but not too rare, will hold their value. Gotcha. For a Investment million great automobiles. For a million and change, you pick up a Mercedes Benz 300 SL Gullwing. All right. There you go. That and gold. Don't expect, by the way, to take dividends off it or live on this million dollars, but you can point to yeah. it in your garage. Yeah, you can take show it, everybody. Take it for a spin. Next is a, a Stefan Hoffer, chief investment strategist of LGT Bank in Hong Kong. The key question that high net worth individual investors ask today is, should I close out my U.S. equity positions? And is it time to buy China? Should I close out my U.S. equity key, positions? Key investors are asking that? Okay. Yeah. Should I close? It to, should I sell my U.S. stocks? Every single yeah. one? On the former, oh. we advise clients to stick with their U.S. positions. So good for him. Or if markedly still underweight, to actually add more. On the latter... We think it's too soon to average down or stock up on China-related equities, notwithstanding their significant underperformance this year. On the U.S., the growth story is just too compelling to ignore. According to the U.S. Federal Reserve, household wealth in the U.S. has now exceeded $100 trillion. Very likely, this is the largest pool of wealth in recorded human economic history. The pre-global financial crisis peak in U.S. wealth in 2007 was close to $70 trillion. And then he goes into this blah, 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 about why you should stay in U.S. stocks. That's fine. You should stay in U.S. stocks because over the long term, that's been the place to be. Yeah. On China, he talks about not. So I kind of agree with this. I don't need all the so, mumbo jumbo. Uh, yes, do not load up on China and do not close out your U.S. stocks. Okay. All right. So kind of a normal. The other way to play, though, he says. Oh, we have an alternate. All right. On a purely personal level, my out-of-the-box investment idea is to buy contemporary Korean art. (laughs) That's an out-of-the-box. It's like, well, you could have a diversified equity portfolio. Yeah, you know, that's pretty plain Jane for a lot of people. I have another idea. How about contemporary Korean art? I know what you're thinking, Mr. Client. (laughs) I know, I know you think this is, it's already reached its peak, but there's still, it's still got room to <laughs> grow. Oh my gosh. All right. What's the next one? Eddie Hu. Uh, these are all Hong Kong based people, by the way, art advisory specialist at City Private Bank, Hong Kong. Before you think about investing a million in a painting, that was my first thought, by <laughs> the way, make sure you really like what you're buying. Given the fickle nature of the art market, you should get stuck with it. You could get stuck with it for several years. So get something you'd like to see on your wall to hear all. <laughs> The wall of your tent, if it's your only million dollars, I've got a exactly. million dollar, got a million dollar collection. It's inside the shed I bought on Home Depot that we live in. To my uh, storage unit. Yes. <laughs> now collectors are chasing works by 20th century Asian artists whose Western peers have long been recognized. Uh, yeah. Okay. Goes through those. How Hong, head of research and chief strategist at Bocom International Holdings. 
For the Chinese, time is cyclical, a tapestry of monsoon seasons and the rise and fall of dynasties. The I Ching, for instance, is a book of divination based on cycles. And so it is with economies, too. Our research has shown that there exist well-defined short cycles of around three to four years in the U.S. and China's economies. Every few years, when the short cycles in the U.S. and China entwine, significant gyrations will occur in markets in the social domain. We're now about to enter such a phase. The confluence of the declining U.S. and China economic cycles soon will prove to be too tough to overcome. And uh, protect your position by buying put options. You shouldn't be buying. A million dollars worth of puts. Okay. This person says you shouldn't be buying, you shouldn't be selling. Buy put positions. And as long as volatility is low, you've got yourself a cheap insurance policy against the downdraft. There will be better entry points after the storm. I like the fact that Eddie says don't panic, but just think about defense. I like that. Put options? Maybe not. Uh, for a really out-of-the-box investment, I put my money into Kuei Chao Mutai, the fiery Chinese liquor. The only investment, <laughs> the only investment outperformed China's housing market in the last two decades. Like some of the finest French Bordeaux wines, supply strictly limited and appreciates value with age. Uh, Goodwin Ga says uh, Ho Chi Minh City real estate. It's a no brainer. <laughs> no brainer. Uh, and then William Ma, uh, chief investment officer at Noah Holdings, says with all the clouds on the horizon, we advise focusing on markets less correlated to global uncertainty. Basically, says uh, uh, they're overweight Vietnam, overweight uh, India, emerging markets. I'm a fan of emerging markets, but a million dollars in emerging markets, if that's all you've got. It's a big, big swing. I think it's funny, the uh, location bias. You mentioned that all these interview folks are from the Far East and like all of their answers were Far East related. By Asian stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you should have Vietnam stocks. You should have Ho Chi Minh City real estate. You should have this Chinese liquor company. Yeah. It's just like I remember reading a study a long time ago about um, home bias in Norway. You know, they represent like 1% of the world's GDP or something. And yet... If you look at investment portfolios of Norwegians, it's almost uniformly Norwegian companies, you know, even though they don't have a very broad market for that. You buy what um, you know. Buy what you know. Yep. Yeah. 